So the presentation I have to share today is the church at the forefront of higher education in the digital age. And I, I think I showed that to one of my parents and they're like, that is a mouthy title. But I, I feel like it really brings together what we're trying to do as Cache, an organization which I'll share a little bit more about um, our work with that group. But it's really the, those components of wanting to equip the church to be involved in this realm of higher education and thinking strategically about what that looks like within the digital age, environment, technologies that are springing up every day and how we can best utilize that those things for the kingdom. So um, this presentation is going to be kind of an intersection um, weaving together of those different areas of the church's involvement in higher education, looking at what's going on, especially in the realm of online education and how those things can be utilized, particularly where Cache is working right now in the developing world, and then how technology um, fits in with that. And as I shared earlier, for those of you who are um, with us this morning, this is going to be a little bit of a case study approach because it's building a lot upon what we've learned as an organization in the last three years, especially this past year piloting um, two sites in Kenya um, and looking to plan our third one um, in Myanmar, hopefully this summer, to launch. So um, just a little bit about me very quickly. I have directed um, Cache for, I guess, about the last year or two. Started with the organization. We're about three years old. So just came on. I had finished um, my PhD up at the University of Minnesota. I'm a Pepperdine grad, so have spent some time in Southern California as well. But um, basically, it was this group of seasoned, older, wise men, different um, ministry, professional, academic experience coming together saying, we want to equip local churches to be centers of higher education in the community. And um, that's not a, a necessarily new paradigm. There's a lot of local churches doing theological education and doing very well at that. But they wanted something a little broader in terms of um, more liberal arts, um, giving students skills that they can actually use. And so um, I providentially got linked with that group um, a couple months after I'd finished my doctorate. And I was available and employed, and uh, they brought me on. And so for the last about three years of my life, I've been um, pouring a lot of myself into helping build this initiative. And God has been very gracious to bring um, just a wonderful team of people around the world to, to work with us, collaborate, um, resources, funding that's been needed. So we are very, um, very blessed, and I'm very thankful to work with Cache. So just a little bit of the structure of what I'd like to cover today. The why, the what, and the how. So why do we do what we do, especially looking at some of the historical, theological, sociological factors within um, this paradigm and what we're advocating. Um, the what, what our model has looked like and some of the strategies we used. And then how, so what have we learned in terms of how we've done this and then how can that apply to your own work as educators, practitioners, um, ministry leaders. And so um, just to kind of give you a little introduction, there's going to be elements, I hope, um, just for each one of you here, um, depending on your context, where you work, what you do, um, that I hope you can pull out of this. It might not be the whole thing. I don't want this to be um, a promotion for Cache, just sharing what our organization is doing. But I hope to share some of the things we've learned that you can take into your own ministries. And so um, they'll just kind of be interspersed throughout, um, especially in these latter sections that we'll get to later. So the first question, which is really why we exist, um, why should the church be involved in higher education? Why, why is this even an important topic or question to be asking in the first place? And for us, it really goes back to um, the belief that this is God's plan. His church is who he has chosen to accomplish his mission in the world. Um, Christ has promised that he will build his church. I love, I think it's um, John Piper who's talked about he didn't church promise to build schools, hospitals, NGOs, those are all good things, but it's his church that he's promised to build, and so we want to be um, behind his church, um, working through it in this area. And so just a few more verses real quickly I want to share, and he put all things under his feet, it gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And then a little bit later in Ephesians, um, so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. And so we really believe in the church. We believe she's God's vessel, and we want to work through her um, in the way we go about our work. And so what is that mission that God has given to his church? 
Well, we look at the Great Commission and see um, most clearly what he's equipped and desires for his church to do, to go make disciples of all nations. And so through higher education, that's what we want to be part of accomplishing um, in the world, is that cause of dis for discipleship and seeing the church strengthened in that area. And specifically thinking about discipleship long term. Discipleship is a life on life process that the church needs to be involved in. And I feel like um, this quote from David Mathis really gets at what that looks like. Does disciple all nations not call to mind how Jesus himself discipled his men? They were, after all, his disciples. And when they heard him say, disciple all nations, would they not think this discipleship is what <laughs> he did with them? Sorry about that. Investing prolonged real life, day in, day out, intentional time with younger believers in order to bring them to maturity, as well as model for them how to disciple others in the same way. And so the model we're trying to encourage in our local churches is really helping them get back to this type of discipleship model and doing that in the context of higher education. And um, as many of us know, um, maybe have experienced ourselves or um, sent, sent children, um, nieces, nephews off to universities, that's not what happens. They have a four year, sometimes longer span that they're being taught, really forming um, values, principles, decisions, making decisions about the rest of their lives. And a lot of them don't have people who are doing this. And so we see the higher education college years as a really strategic time to be involved in this process. And it's a process that the church um, for a long time has understood in terms of what discipleship looks like. The culture of the first century put a high priority um, on learning through a ten apprenticeship teaching them to obey all that Christ has commanded. This necessarily involves both modeling and verbal teaching. And so what we are trying to do is bring in the, the teaching component through online education, but also training local facilitators and mentors to really be involved in the modeling life on life aspect of working with the students. I won't read this whole quote, but this line, um, discipleship, or it doesn't say it this way, but caught, not taught. We have one of our advisory board members who is really um, instilled that in me. And that's so true. I think all of us in, in this room would say that much more than someone's didactic teaching, it's been watching a life that they've modeled for us in terms of what a disciple of Christ looks like that's been most powerful. And so a little bit going off of that, where the church has come into this model of um, being involved in higher education was really Christians who were the first to go after an educational model that was not just for the elites, but was for all men. And Christians were part of establishing some of the first universities as well. Um, and we might attribute a lot to the Greeks and Romans in terms of education, but they were really much more focused on the cultural elites and not um, leveling the playing field um, in the way that we think education should do. And then during the medieval era um, was when within uh, monasteries, there was a lot that happened in education in terms of bringing together a lot of different subject areas and having um, that be the repository of knowledge. And so they were really the ones who preserved a lot of um, the things that we have as important in education today. And then if you didn't know, friars were some of the first, they were the first to found um, the greatest universities in England, Oxford and Cambridge. And similarly in the US, um, the Bible directly inspired the first 123 colleges and universities in America, um, including Harvard, Princeton, Yale. And so we've had a very strong influence of Christians and the church in the universities around the world that have been started, and really the church playing a huge role in starting universities um, centuries before. And so we look at this history, and then we look at today, and um, in large part, I think there are churches that are still playing a role um, in colleges and universities that, that hasn't been lost completely, and we're not saying that that doesn't exist, but what is the strategic role that the church can be thinking about playing in higher education today? Well, here's a few um, pieces of data or statistics that we need to, to consider, and really to consider this in light of this idea of a Kairos moment. 
thinking about how are things converging at this moment in history in the generation that we live in that God might have for us to utilize in terms of the role that the church plays in higher education. Well, first one I think that we need to look at is just the access crisis that we have in, in higher education. And I know there's a lot that can be said about the US and um, especially in, in Southern California. I'm um, living in Florida right now, so a little bit different context. But I know that the California, um, the state university system here has had huge struggles with access. But then you think on a global level, we have 75% of college age youth almost that aren't enrolled in college. Um, 7%, under 7% in Sub-Saharan Africa who are actually enrolled in college. Malawi, I think it's 0.8% is um, the percentage of students enrolled in college. So around the world, I mean, the challenges are just enormous um, in this area. And then the potential that a student can anticipate earning with more than a secondary diploma, 67% higher. So there's some pretty big payoffs for being able to attend college. Um, besides that, we have a pretty big um, spiritual crisis that as the church we need to attend to in terms of the faith of our young people and what's happening for them after they graduate from high school. So nearly three out of five young Christians disconnect from the church permanently or for an extended period of time. Um, nearly 25% of young adults say that faith isn't relevant to their interests or career. And more than one in five young adults believe that the church ignores the problems of the real world. And almost one fourth of young adults say that the Bible is not taught clearly enough or with enough frequency. So we have the, the access piece. And then is the church thinking about the even more important element of the spiritual development and growth of our young people. And then we have the technology piece as well. And as we all know, um, there's been a huge um, explosive growth in this area. Um, tenfold increase in internet users from 1999 to 2013. Um, the first statistic up there, in 1995, less than 1% 1 of the world population had access to the internet. Today, around 40% of the world population has internet access. And then um, this one's really mind boggling. In terms of internet users, the first billion was reached in 2005. The second billion was reached in 2010. The third billion will be reached by the end of this year, and this is from 2014. So just huge growth in internet users. And thinking especially in terms of millennials, um, this is where they're at. This is all, well, for those on the younger end, um, I'm 27, so part of that generation as well. Um, this is what we've, we've known for a lot of our lives. And so this is kind of our, our playing field. And so we need to consider how millennials influence the way we deliver education, what they expect of education, and what's um, familiar territory for them. And they're forcing us to think about how we communicate and educate in new ways. So that's something that we need to be mindful of. All right, I'm going to switch to um, an infographic that talks a little bit about MOOCs. But I'm curious, um, anyone here not heard that term, MOOC? No, it's all familiar. Someone want to share what it, it stands for? Oh, sorry. <laughs> that was a giveaway. Massive open <laughs> online course. <laughs> so 2012, they, um, they kind of labeled the year of the MOOC. And so that was the year when there was a lot of hype. Um, I read the Chronicle of Higher Education. And so just all these articles coming in about MOOCs and how they're going to change higher education and what's going on in that area. And so Three years later, 2015, there's kind of been a lot of um, settling in terms of our expectations for MOOCs and how we use them. But th we're still kind of figuring out where do these fit within higher education. And we've actually um, tried to build um, a significant amount of our curriculum around MOOC courses. So I want to give you a little bit of an introduction to what these are. So as we've talked about, MOOC is a massive open online course. And the significant part of a MOOC is that they can support an unlimited number of enrollees. So huge potential in terms of reach and access for these MOOCs. There's mainly three um, predominant providers in the MOOC space, although there are many more be besides the, but these. But Coursera, edX, and Udacity are the biggest ones. And you can see um, 
I mean huge in terms of Coursera, 532 courses. So they've just done an enormous amount of work, also building um, a pretty significant international um, presence on their MOOC platform as well. 107 partner schools, um, some of the top universities in the world are affiliated with them. Students from 190 countries, so huge reach that they've had. And that's actually a for-profit company. Um, I don't think they've yet figured out how to monetize what they're doing, but um, something that um, we've had to be aware of, I'll share it a little bit later in the presentation, um, in terms of working with Coursera, um, what we've had to do, work around that. edX is a nonprofit, and um, Udacity is also for-profit, you can see up there. Um, not as huge of a reach, but still very significant players within this space. A couple other names you might want to be familiar with, um, Canvas Networks. Canvas is a, a learning management system, and they have um, a number of courses on their platform. A great place um, in terms of course resources. Um, Iversity Allison, I really like Allison because they're more skills-based in the content they provide and actually provide certificates or diplomas. Um, I'm trying to think of some of them. I think early childhood education is one, um, business, um, entrepreneurship, accounting, so things that are a lot more practical in nature. Um, they're a great resource for that. Open Learning and then Udemy as well. And Udemy, I think most of their courses you do pay for, but it, it's not much um, that they charge. So you can see the breakdown of where um, the courses are in terms of subject offerings. So a lot in um, computer science and programming has been a big area, but then um, humanities is actually the largest, which is kind of surprising within this area. User demographics, this is from Coursera. It's actually really interesting when we look at MOOCs and their influence. So the, the median age is 35, um, but also 40% from developing countries. So that's a pretty high representation um, from the developing world. And I think that that's commendable just because of what we've learned working with students in the developing world and the internet challenges there, the cost of internet, um, that they're still very motivated with these resources. Um, student engagement, a little bit there. And then this one's interesting as well, prior education level. So you can see actually a lot of the MOOC users are quite educated. And I think that that's been a little bit of the criticism that has come from MOOCs because they're supposed to be providing an education that's free for those without, but actually the users of them, um, a lot of them are already very educated and um, have had opportunities to pursue higher education. Um, this website I'm just gonna highlight. I think if you just um, Google MOOC infographic, you can see um, this infographic yourself. I won't go through all this, but if it's of interest to you, I just wanted to highlight that this is there um, to learn a little bit about MOOCs. And then this last statistic, where MOOC users are coming from, you can see almost 40% from the US, but then um, significant representation when you put it all together from a lot of other parts of the world, too. So that is a little bit about MOOCs that I just wanted to highlight. Um, but another piece of um, the online learning puzzle is open educational resources. And these are actually really important to know about because um, our organization has learned a lot in terms of the difference between MOOCs and OER. And OER are actually um, a, a more strategic player, in our opinion, in terms of what can be done with online learning. So just a little introduction, OER, they represent public domain or another copyright license for free use and repurposing of resources for teaching, research, and learning. So they include things like complete courses, textbooks, tests, course materials, videos that can be streamed, journal articles, modules, and any other materials or tools used to encourage learning. So the significance of OER um, is because of they have the, this um, title or label 5R permissions that facilitate free access to materials and modification to make them better. So these 5Rs include the ability to retain, reuse, revise, remix, and redistribute. So this would basically be like um, Creative Commons license or maybe another license that they have, but they're giving free use to the user um, 
for these five R's. So to use, um, to revise the content as you, you'd like to redistribute them. And that's actually really important, um, as I'll show in just a little bit, for the purposes of what we're trying to do with Cache. So the potential of OER is that there are more than 400 million um, openly licensed resources that reside online. Um, approximately half of all institutions in the US, this is staggering, half of all institutions in the US have at least one course that utilizes OER. So a lot of institutions are actually catching on to the potential of using this in their own curriculum. Okay, so a little bit in terms of MOOCs, OER, um, some differences there. Um, we kind of, when we started, didn't see the delineation, but now we're realizing the big thing is MOOCs are proprietary, while OER um, is not. And so there's a lot more potential there for use. So that's a little bit in the online learning space, but there's a step further we need to go if we really want to make these online learning materials that are there and freely available um, useful for our purposes. Not just useful in terms of um, good pedagogy and teaching for our students, but useful in terms of what we talked about in the beginning, getting back to discipleship and really mentoring our students. And I, th I thought this was an interesting statistic um, from, it's called Gallup Purdue Index, done with, I believe, a large number of, yeah, 30,000 college graduates. I'm not sure if they were exclusively from Purdue, um, but I mean, completely secular, and yet you can see the craving and the value that these students have found um, in the face-to-face -face relationships. So graduates who checked the following three boxes were more than twice as likely to have a sense that they're flourishing at work. So a sense that they're flourishing at work tied to having a professor who made them excited about learning, feeling that teachers cared about them, and working alongside a mentor. And so if we are to stick a MOOC in OER resource or open educational resource in front of our students, they're not getting these things from an online course. And so we need to be thinking about how do we incorporate these important elements into the overall package, educational package that we're offering to our students. Now the sad thing is that only 14% claim to have experienced these three things together in college. So even our face-to-face -face universities um, unfortunately aren't doing the greatest job at incorporating these elements together. So we need to be rethinking what we're doing to make this happen. And so for Cache, this really comes at what does it look like to take these things, to package them together, and be able to offer a globally accessible, discipleship-driven, also culturally relevant because we're working within different cultural contexts, biblically faithful because we want the Word of God to be at the center of what our students are experiencing and learning as Cache students. What does this look like for that to happen through the local church? in the 21st century? Well, I think on the way to answering that question, it helps to know a little bit of the landscape in terms of um, where some of the higher education players fit um, within that, that question. And I just kind of put, um, I don't know what you call it, some matrix kind of spectrum um, graphic up here to illustrate at the top end, you have um, models that are more church-based um, this way you have models that are more focused on stronger tech integration and then where these four fit within that. So traditional college or university setting, um, obviously not church-based or contextualized within a local church. Um, and face-to-face -face setting, maybe use, uh, utilizing more of a um, more technology in their approach, maybe hybrid or offering online courses, but lower on the tech integration scale. Um, on the other end, Christian online degree programs, still not church-based. You can sign up, pay your money, get your courses, um, but not a lot that happens in terms of discipleship and life on life formation. Um, up here on the left side, local church-based institutes focus on theological training. And when we started Cache, that was what we came across the most in terms of church-based um, higher education, that it's happening within the theological realm, but not in terms of this broader um, idea of equipping students with liberal arts and vocational skills. And so Cache, we fit um, more in this end of using a very heavy technology approach because we do use a lot with online learning, but also situating that within 
um, the local church. And so what that model looks like is um, the diagram you see here. So couched or situated within a local church context. And then key to that is what we call academic mentors. And so those are the ones, usually individuals from the local church, doesn't have to be, but that's how it's worked at our sites in Kenya, who we train in specific skills, um, tools that they use in their role. And they're, they're the disciple makers and also kind of the tutors for their students in their experience. And then there's five key areas that students are exposed to during their time with CACHE. So um, one is university level education. So we are offering this as something that is college level. Um, for the students who've been serving in Kenya, both of them are, um, the sites are in slum communities. So they are not um, college accredited in terms of um, having to pay that kind of tuition. We have a partner institute um, actually in California that is willing to offer or issue diplomas at no cost for the students. So that's been a huge blessing to give them some sort of credential, that piece of paper, which in Africa we've learned is huge, but also keep the price point low enough for our students. Um, and then integrating volunteer service, internships, and the mentoring component in addition to their online curriculum that they're studying so that they're getting more of a holistic experience. And so now this is where we get a little bit more into the nitty gritty um, practical of what we've, we've learned with CACHE in terms of utilizing online curriculum. So one of the first places we've had to start is figuring out what kinds of programs are we going to offer. So we started in 2012, which as I mentioned was um, kind of facetiously titled the year of the MOOC. And so we knew there was a lot happening within the online education realm. But for us, it was a question of where do we even start? Um, there's so much out there. Um, how do we find what's, what's worthwhile? How do we package this into something that the students can actually use to become equipped as professionals in a certain discipline? So we had to start by outlining for us what represented a well-rounded curriculum. And so what we have at this point are two diploma programs, one in entrepreneurship and business and one in software development. Um, so we have kind of three tiers to that curriculum. Um, listed up here. So foundational is Christian worldview. So we have some Christian worldview content in there that we expose the students to, and then liberal arts. So we actually use um, from a website called Freethink University, and they have a lot of, um, they're just, they're very short, two or three hour courses in different kind of liberal arts topics just to get the students thinking critically, which um, we've learned in Africa is really, really important because it's not often how they've been taught in their um, secondary education that they've had. So giving them just a broad foundation in liberal arts and then professional courses, which as I mentioned, are the business or software development tracks. And so we structured a program saying, these are the topics we want to cover, and then finding courses to plug in to that. Um, then it was identifying um, online learning materials that we felt were quality and accomplished the purpose that we have. And I feel like that has become a lot easier as even on that MOOC infographic, you can see people are kind of curating and pulling together. Here's different places you can go for online sources. Um, but we, we did a lot, um, we did research at the beginning trying to figure out who are the main players and where do we go, what courses are available, um, outlining all of that. So, that, that just takes work, but it's much easier when you know what you're, you're looking for. And um, a little bit further on, I'll show you some of the um, main sources that we would recommend just based on what we've seen. And then identifying, adapting after that. So we don't stop with, OK, here's a good course available on Coursera or Allison.com. Um, we want to adapt that and make it relevant to our students. And that's actually been one of the most exciting parts to me, I feel like, of what um, we're trying to do with CACHE is adapting online curriculum. And so you have a lot of great courses from um, UPenn, Yale, Harvard, MIT, really good content, but is it contextualized for students in Africa, in the Philippines, in Myanmar, in some of these places where we hope to work? Um, that's actually been one of our biggest jobs, is taking our learning framework that I'll show you um, in just a minute, and then making sure the course fits within that. 
and then um, organizing the materials. So it's, it's all scattered all over the internet, but we want to make it really user friendly for our students and our mentors at the local sites. And so um, that's been a big focus in terms of making sure that our content is organized on an LMS and then also making sure um, if possible, that they can get it offline because the internet challenges in the developing world um, can be very significant. So we want to make that an option. And then piloting the curriculum and being ready and willing to adapt and revise as we go. So I mentioned um, that process of adapting curriculum. And so for us, um, every ministry organization, this might look different, but this is our 4C learning framework. And these are the four emphases that we want to be integrated within our curriculum because we believe this is really critical um, to what a cache student needs to leave the program with. And so the first one is Christ-centered worldview. And a big part of how that has looked for us with our curriculum is Socratic dialogue and helping the students ask questions of what they're learning, um, be able to critique and um, really compare and contrast with, OK, this is what I'm being taught from this MOOC from the University of Maryland professor. How does that align with what the Bible teaches on microeconomics, for instance? And so we have um, a learning template that one of our staff members has created that really helps them think through um, some of these worldview questions. And it's, it's broader in terms of leading a, a whole Socratic dialogue session, which is something we've had to do a lot of teaching on with our, our mentors in Africa, but really getting to them to think that way. And also integrating sources within a course that bring a biblical perspective. And so you might have a, a MOOC from a secular university, but there are some great resources. Um, even what Open Biola has, I really appreciate to be able to take a 30-minute a clip from a business professor and say, OK, here's a Christian businessman talking about you know, this topic, microeconomics, finance, whatever it might be. Um, you know, and how does that compare to what this secular professor is saying? So that's been one big piece for us, and that takes time to integrate that. And thankfully, we've had a couple volunteers. Um, one business student at Taylor University right now is working on a, um, I think it's a Coursera course for us, just creating those types of questions. We also have an MIT PhD student who's taken a computer science course and integrated some really great worldview questions into that and kind of reworking it. So. That's something that takes time, but it's really important for us. Then in terms of um, calling, character, community, that's a little bit more the, the intangible life-on-life -life element. Just by working with a mentor, having our students as a cohort, going through the course, um, also integrating service learning projects into the courses. So um, our academic coordinator um, has she used to work, I think, as a service learning coordinator for another organization. So she's really strong on that piece of integrating projects that are meaningful, where the students are able to apply what they're learning, but use it in a community in a creative way. So this is kind of what we use as our filter when we get an online course. Um, it's only really half done for us, because we want it to fit in with this learning framework. And so we've done a lot in terms of recruiting others and also just um, in-house revising courses so that they meet this framework. So as I mentioned, service learning is an important part of what we want our courses um, to contribute to the student's education. And so we use a model called Seed Projects. Um, and Seed Projects planning, it's just a really simple way of identifying a need within the community. They're very time-bound projects. Usually they take one week to complete, and then there's a clear end to them. And so we try to incorporate this into um, the student's experience. Um, there's a template. If, if you're interested, please ask me, because I'd love to share this. I can email it to you um, for seed projects, and um, I can share more about what that's looked like for our students. And then this is just a, a template or rubric, actually, for evaluating those seed projects. So we're still you know, talking about the higher education level. This isn't just a, a side volunteer gig that they're doing. So we want them to know that they're being you know, graded for, for what they're doing, that there are standards that they're called to. So you can just see that our four C's up here within that rubric and what some of those tangible qualities look like in those areas that they're being graded on. And then the other part of the model that we're integrating as well is um, small group um, discipleship meetings. And so this is just a framework 
that we use for how those meetings look. And so you can see there's, there's number one, the personal um, spiritual growth side of that, but then also there's studies. And that's important because it's linking that it's not just um, you have your quiet time devotions and that's, that's one part of you, but you're failing miserably at school, not keeping up and not being dedicated and faithful, but someone who knows you in both realms. And um, just to be more personal for a moment, I was um, homeschooled until I graduated from high school. And so for me, having someone who my mom was my teacher and the one who kept me accountable, but also the one who saw me in every other aspect of life. Um, that, I mean, things can get blurred, but I also feel like that was one of the best things for me to have someone who I knew cared about me in all realms. And so we really want the same for our students. We know that the academic mentor, these are college students, it's not gonna be 24 seven, but still someone um, who's able to help disciple them as a student. Um, as a son or daughter, as a potentially um, employee or intern in all the realms um, where they do life. And then our third component is something called discipline of love. And um, like the seed projects, this is just another um, template developed by a man named Bar Bob Moffat. He's actually our president. He's with the Harvest Foundation in Phoenix. And it's just a really practical tool for planning how you're going to serve um, for the, the week, someone in, in your life. And so there's different realms in terms of church, um, family, um, your community, and then um, different areas within that where the students get involved. But we really want the students to be held accountable to what they're actually doing to serve. Because um, as Kyle actually, when he was doing his keynote earlier, he just put our little slogan up on the, the board and the last part was servant leaders. And that just kind of caught my attention afresh. And that's. It's really what we're trying to do. And so discipline of love is a very practical way of, of getting at cultivating that servant leader heart. And then the final part of this model is getting them to do hands-on internships and really use and apply their skills, um, hopefully within their local communities, but also thinking more broadly in terms of remote internships, especially our students doing software development in IT. There's a lot of ways for them to plug in globally with those skills, and we want to encourage that as well. And so um, just a, a revealing quote about kind of the importance of getting that hands-on experience. Practitioners, mostly business people, work most closely with real-life problems. They experience a messy, diverse, and full of paradox, a, a world that's messy, diverse, and full of paradox and complexity. And um, gosh, the reality is where um, you know, I see our students in Nairobi, what they live with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, we, we don't want to pretend that the problems they're facing are linear and boxed in and neat and easy to solve. Um, but I think by getting out there and working with people who are more skilled, um, more experienced um, within their own context, that's going to mean far more than anything from the West we can package and import into their context. And so that's why this internship piece is so critical. And so for us, this looks like um, real world internships that involve the students within their local economy, as well as I mentioned virtual internships where they're um, working within more of a global context and economy. And then, I mean, most of all, whether that's local or global, something hands on that's preparing them for future employment. And that's especially important within the model we're trying to use because building on a lot of free online courses and MOOCs. Um, there's not always a really um, respected credential that comes with that in the sense that MOOCs are still very new. And so an employer looks at that like, okay, you have the certificate of completion, what does that mean? But if they've worked with someone that can vouch for their character, their work ethic, their skills, um, that's even, a, I think, in some instances, a higher stamp of appro approval than having a piece of paper that may or, not, may or may not um, give them access to employment somewhere. And then the final piece that kind of ties it all together is offering some sort of credentials. So the internship is one way of um, kind of certifying their knowledge, but then on top of that, trying to offer um, some sort of certificate or way of um, validating that what you have um, done in this program is of value. And so for us, that's looked like um, speaking with a number of institutions in different parts of the world, both um, within the US, which um, for our partners overseas does bring a lot more credibility and desirability, um, but also internationally as well, looking at different institutions, being in contact with them about um, 
offering our program through their school. All right, and then kind of the academic mentor piece we touched on a little bit, but I, I just want to highlight um, briefly towards the end what this has looked like for us in terms of preparing the face-to-face, -face. because I really feel like this is the most important piece. And from what we've learned at our two pilot sites, if the mentors um, aren't performing well and aren't doing what they're called to do, everything else um, falls apart. They're really the glue that holds everything together. And so these are um, the four roles that we ask our academic mentors to play. So number one is um, being disciple, disciple makers and mentors to the students. And so that looks like the small group discipleship, but also um, just being there and modeling what it looks like to follow Christ um, with integrity and a heart of love for their students and uh, being the people that they look up to. And for some of these students, they might have never seen that from the homes that they've come from. But um, hopefully, they will get that with their academic mentor in their cachet community. The mentor is also the facilitator for the class. And so they don't need to be the expert. Um, kind of going back to the homeschool parent analogy, um, at least for my parents, they were never subject matter experts. But if I had um, trouble, they could coach me or help me with certain things. Sometimes that meant bringing in someone who was more knowledgeable, a tutor, to help. And so we also encourage our mentors to make connections in the community, to bring in a um, guest lecturer, someone who can do Q&A with the students and help them. And then also um, kind of being the, the administrator um, and working with the technology as well. Because um, basically what they're doing is setting up computer labs um, where the students come to learn. Okay, so I think this piece will kind of tie everything together that I've been talking about um, kind of separately, how this has worked um, and looked for us in practice. So like I said, we started in 2012, and then in 2014, we started our first pilot in Nairobi. And I've been to um, a number of, of countries and um, definitely have seen poverty firsthand, but um, when I went to this community in early 2014, it was like nothing I have ever seen. And still, when I return there, um, it's just one of the hardest environments I've ever been in. Um, it's called Soweto. Um, it's a slum community outside Nairobi. There were the riots there with the, um, they had some post-election violence that broke out. Um, really tough place, but it's where God led us to start our first site. And so we helped equip them with a computer lab um, I'll show you in just a few slides um, the technology that we use there, They're called Raspberry Pis, really little cheap devices, um, but you know can be powerful for the purposes of you know getting them access to computers and basic technology. So we started that way, um, and then I was just in Nairobi in March, and we started our, our second site. So about a year, actually, from the first to the second one. And in that time, we learned a lot from the first to the second uh, in terms of our process and how. Um, we launched. So for both of those sites, we had five Kenyan mentors at each site that we trained to be the academic mentors. And then um, having these diploma programs that I described, software development and entrepreneurship that we offer to the students. And so what have we learned from this experience of piloting these two sites. Um, the next couple slides are going to cover some of the different areas. And the first piece I put up here is technology. And um, anyone know what this is? John knows. <laughs> it's a res yeah, it's a raspberry. Raspberry Pi. So this thing is, is tiny. I wish I would have brought one for you. Um, maybe what, the size of a deck of cards? Yeah. Yeah, it's really small. Um, but. What, it's your CPU, it's your computer processing unit. So we brought a suitcase, box, I think different people from our team brought them over um, when they traveled. And then in country, we got monitors, keyboards, um, mice um, to hook up to them so they had a full working computer. And we thought these were great. Um, there's no reason they shouldn't work. They're cheap, they're like $35 a piece, and durable, and you can interchange and replace parts. But our site didn't think they were so great. And um, there was a really hard learning curve with this, just because they, um, 
it's Linux is their operating system, which they wanted Windows, and um, just not as intuitive as a regular computer. And so for us, this was a really big lesson. And what, what our leader, our Kenyan leader there, would, would tell me, says, work from the known to the unknown. And we were too quick um, here in the US as an organization to make the decision, we're going to make a really big jump because we think these are cool and innovative and um, cost effective. But to our partners on the ground, um, they were so foreign. And it was such a big jump to, to start a model like Cache that's already very different. Some of these students, you know, online learning is so new to them. Then to have the technology piece as well was just too much. And so that was a really big lesson for us was to start with um, what's known and familiar in terms of our, our sites. And so the one we started um, this past March in Kenya, our second pilot site, we let them choose the technology. Um, we helped them raise a budget, and then they purchased what they wanted. And things have been very, very flawless um, in terms of how they've, they've gone with technology. I mean, sometimes there's computer glitches, but nothing like what we had at the first site. So that was a big lesson for us. And then fostering local ownership of technology. Um, as an NGO, I don't know if any of you are um, in that world, but one of the big things that I've been learning a lot um, in, in my role is um, it's easy when you see need. I told you about this community in Kenya where um, it's just it's a horrible slum environment. And so you know, going there, it's like, of course, we need to give them the technology and buy everything for them. And there's such great needs here. And we did that. But then it created um, a, a dynamic that I think was not healthy in terms of us being the donors, the ones giving, and them being the recipients' dependents. And so for our second site, um, we walked alongside them to create um, a budget and proposal, and they submitted it to a funder, got it funded, and everything is theirs. And it's been so freeing not to be involved in the financial aspects of that and have that tie as their donor. And so um, that's just a huge um, recommendation I throw out there um, for any of you working within the nonprofit sphere to really, as much as possible, foster that local ownership. And then sharing innovative technology um, solutions and allowing students to exercise leadership have just been kind of two best practices for us. And so um, in terms of sharing technology solutions, we have things, um, myself personally too, I, I just I like finding out about new technologies, things that can help with um, internet and um, in the developing world especially. And so just really having a, a dialogue um, with our partners, I think it's been much healthier Whereas before, I think my tendency might have been to say, here's the technology. You got to implement this. Sorry about that. Um, now it's more you know, a dialogue in terms of here's something I learned about. Think about if it works in your context, and vice versa, because there's things undoubtedly that they're going to know about and be able to share that we've never come across. And then allowing students to exercise leadership. This has been one of the um, funner parts of seeing our pilots um, start, is seeing how the students take to technology. And in our first pilot site, we've had some very gifted IT students. And recently, our CTO had to take a leave of absence. He's in um, Whittier, actually, um, volunteers for us. And so one of the students at our first site in Kenya is taking his place. And he's working with him to train him and lead him. So that's been really neat um, just to see how um, raising up from within has been a really beautiful thing. And then a little bit on curriculum. We touched on this with the MOOCs and OER. But um, just a couple best practices that we've learned. Um, first of all, know your students and their needs. Um, for us, especially working in Africa, um, we've, I feel like, learned a lot more than anything um, we've contributed or given back so far, just in terms of the things that um, are relevant within African culture. And then, as I mentioned, I was just in Asia a couple weeks ago um, with John and just seeing so we love this idea of debate and Socratic dialogue and discussion. Um, in the Philippines, at least, where we were, um, that's, that's not as much a part of their learning culture. And that's, that's not good or bad. It's just it's how they're comfortable communicating and conveying ideas. And so um, kind of some of the, the practices that we want to incorporate, and we're going to have to rethink that in terms of what does that look like within an Asian culture where um, it's not necessarily a good thing to debate and you know punch down your, um, not your enemy, but your, the person you're talking to across the table. So um, that's been really huge. And I would say the biggest thing, that just takes time working um, within the culture and context and really listening um, to the leaders 
as well that we're working with and um, time spent as well. I, I haven't um, moved overseas yet, though John is kind of convincing me that's something that would be good for me. But um, just the visits that I've had in Nairobi three times maybe within about 14 months, just you learn a lot each time. And so that's been really valuable. Um, the difference between MOOCs and OER we talked about, mainly um, the potential of OER in terms of if you're adapting and recontextualizing material, OER is going to be a lot more helpful for you in terms of what you can do. Um, learn from those who are farther ahead. Um, for about the first two years of our development, we didn't pilot. We didn't start anything. We just talked to a lot of people who were doing similar things and learned from other organizations. And that was really valuable. And then in March earlier this year, my colleague and I went to Rwanda, visited a couple programs there. And it's just amazing when you connect with um, other organizations that have a similar vision, just their willingness to share and offer wisdom and advice and lessons that they've already learned. And so that's been huge for us. And also their willingness to share resources with us from one organization in Rwanda. We got um, some amazing um, lesson plan material and content that they're willing to share. So um, we've just learned a lot that in reaching out, there's a lot that um, surprising how much people are willing to share and give. Um, provide a solid foundation to build upon. And so for us, that's looked like having um, a foundation semester, we call it. It's an entry point into the program with the curriculum. So some of what we provided online is a little bit more advanced. And so just giving them an introduction to how they learn online, what e-learning um, looks like um, through experience, and also having, we have um, writing, digital literacy, Christian worldview course that kind of gives them um, more of a foundation before they jump into more advanced courses. And then this process of identifying, adapting, structuring, preparing, and monitoring. And I don't want to take too much more time, so I'm just going to go through um, really quickly what this, this has looked like. So just identifying. Um, this, I can share this slide later. There's an um, infographic that I won't go through it now, but basically just showing the major MOOC players. I got to click on it, though, because. Um, you know, I didn't bring it up, but it's this web of how all the MOOC um, and online course players are connected. And it's really amazing once you kind of see them all thrown together, how many there are. Um, so there's a lot up there, but also don't, don't limit yourself to those things because um, there's a lot of other smaller players as well. And I just have a little bit, um, a few listed up there. Um, a couple I wanted to highlight. Um, GCF Learn Free is a really good one for more basic online learning content, we get our digital literacy course from them. But the thing I love is um, we contacted them. They sent us a flash drive with their content. So we could take that to Africa and download and just very willing and generous um, to give away what, what they have. Um, Open Biola, I love. And also similarly, um, Luxpera. If you haven't seen what Regent University in Virginia is doing, um, they want to put together uh, I think a full bachelor's degree program for really low cost. Um, they're starting small right now. They don't have everything out, but also want to give away content for those courses. So you pay extra if you want the degree. If you just want the knowledge, it's there. So I highly recommend looking at what they're doing. Um, and then just one other thing I wanted to mention is if a course is um, proprietary, copyright protected, We've had really good success with reaching out to different course providers, saying, hey, this is what we do. This is what we want to use your course for, um, and getting permission directly from them. And um, usually when it's a professor you reach out to, um, no, no hesitation, just very generous and gracious. So don't be afraid if something you're not sure about or it is proprietary asking um, to use it and sharing what you're doing. And um, we did that with one writing course, and then we're able to send I don't remember if it was pictures or video to the professors from the students interacting with that course in Africa. And it's something they love. So it's, it's neat um, to see that kind of willingness to share. Adapt. So we talked a little bit about this with our 4C framework. And um, so whatever that is for you, know what the core principles are um, to which you want the online course um, to be linked with. And then be able to follow that in terms of how you build out that course. Um, for us, that's also looked like connecting with other subjects, um, subject experts who can help build course material, and then incorporating some sort of social process in that. So as I mentioned, we use a lot with Socratic dialogue, but maybe as we move into other contexts where that's not 
um, so much the social norm for interacting. It might look like another social process, but I think building that in, that face-to-face -face social interaction is really important. And then finding service linkages into the local community. And so for us, these are kind of like our best practices in terms of we get a course online, but then what are we doing to enhance it or to add value to it? And then structuring um, for us, this has been through an LMS. Um, there's so many options out there, so it's really just finding what, what's most appropriate for your situation. LMS is a learning management system where you can organize course materials. Um, I have a little um, infographic here. You can look in, into it at your own time, but just how do you organize a course? What resources do you use? Encouraging student interaction. Um, organizing your file system, just some good things to think about we don't have time to cover right now in terms of how um, to build out an online course online. And for us, um, one thing we've learned is just the amount of time that it takes. And so just a warning, be prepared, because if you want to develop something, um, something good, um, organized, that's easy to interact with, user-friendly, it does take time, but it's worth it because then that course is there and you can use it repeatedly for um, semester after semester. And then for us, building in this face-to-face -face piece um, is, is actually preparing our course facilitators to be able to lead this course. And so right now, what that looks like is making sure that our course facilitators are familiar with the content. Um, they're going through the course in advance of the students. Like I said, they're not the subject matter experts. They can pull in others um, if they need that, but they're the kind of the guide on the side. I don't know if you've heard that terminology from going from the um, sage on the stage to the guide on the side, but it's the guide on the side that we really want our mentors to be. And a big part of preparing them for that is making sure they're familiar with um, the flipped classroom model. And some of you have probably seen this. I know it's a little small, but um, really going from the classroom time, not being focused on lecturing, but engaging them in discussions, projects, hands-on activities. And so the lecture is actually the online content um, that we're using with our students. And it's um, the classroom time that we want our mentors to use for more meaningful, hands-on activities. And then for us, um, this is a classroom in Kenya, our site that we recently started, um, being able to monitor. And that's been one of the hardest parts for us because we're working cross-continentally. And so um, how we do that, right now we're still learning, but it started with having a strategy in place, so having some reporting mechanisms, weekly um, checking calls with our leader there. Um, sometimes that's that's difficult. Yesterday we had one scheduled and it was rainy in Nairobi and so we couldn't connect, so we had it this morning. But really just trying to be on top of communication with our local leaders. Um, and then making sure we're hearing the students' voices. One of my favorite things my colleague did is on our discussion board, um, on our LMS, putting together a place where the students could leave feedback. and things that we would have never known um, without giving them that platform to share. We had a call um, a little while back just to check in with the students and hear from them on Skype. And so just having some sort of um, channel that you can hear your students' voices through is really important. And then don't be afraid to, ma afraid to make modifications as you go. Um, very important. So this is one of our academic mentors in Nairobi. His name is um, Joseph and just wanted to kind of lay out three um, really important principles. And I think this is true whatever your role is, whether it's you know, a cachet academic mentor or a university professor or a secondary school teacher. Um, these are the things that um, really, really matter in terms of what it looks like to be um, an influence in the life of the next generation. So we want our academic mentors to be disciple makers first, um, have a determination to grow and adapt, and then diligence over the long haul, and really for us that means learning and being willing to give feedback and learn with us um, as we pioneer this new model. And so just to summarize um, kind of some of the big lessons we've learned, um, I feel like what, what we're doing, at least I've seen in Africa, um, is kind of introducing a new paradigm that um, students and mentors are not very familiar with in terms of how they've learned what their own education has looked like. And so number one is part of that, the change we're introducing 
requires time. And um, I think it was really easy at our first pilot site to want that to happen overnight. And I think we've gotten, we've become a lot more patient um, with ourselves, with our partners, with this whole process, because it really does take time. And I think that that, that lesson applies to so many different things, but especially within um, introducing a newer um, paradigm. And then change is it's reinforced by incentives. And so looking at, um, you know, I think our students and our mentors are, are intrinsically motivated. They're hungry for higher education. They want something to be able to offer you know, opportunities to young people in their community. But um, they've got to survive as well and put food on the table for their families. And the students, um, a lot of other demands come up when you live in um, the environments that some of them do, and um, realizing that this isn't this isn't their life. This isn't all that they have. And so, thinking about what are some of those incentives. And for us, our volunteer, our mentors were volunteers initially. Um, and so, thinking about how can we build in some sort of comp compensation mechanism, even um, growing in leadership and responsibility, um, higher positions that they can move to. And then also for our students, um, one thing that we would really like to be able to do is. Um, for good, being good standing in the program, um, being eligible for some sort of laptop loan or maybe paying a little bit each semester towards owning the laptop once they graduate. And so um, we saw that from the, the program in um, Rwanda. Each student had, had a laptop in um, the education program we visited. And so wanting to build in things like that um, really adds a lot to the student's experience. And it's small but uh, meaningful. And then change replicates itself in others. And so our hope is that one day our students, these are academic mentors seated on the table with my colleague, Ji Young there. Um, I hope that one day these, these are graduates of our program and that our mentors really are the models in terms of um, what it looks like to, to make disciples and to facilitate learning and really being pioneers with um, a different way of learning within um, the Kenyan context and wherever else we might go. So I, I love this picture because it's, it's the classroom. I don't know if you can see much um, in Kenya at our newest site that we started, but you can see they have about 10 cu um, computers just around the perimeter of the classroom where the students work, and then um, several of those are mentors at that site there. So just really neat. It's, it's small, but it's significant what I see them doing. So at the end of the day, um, we like to call ourselves a network because it's not just about us as Cache. What um, we're doing you know, is the ones to, to give away all this information, us being at the center, but really connecting a lot of different players and people within the body of Christ. Because if we go back to where we started, we do want to be about the church and, and seeing God accomplish his vision through her. And so we kind of we want to be on the sidelines equipping and resourcing the church in whatever ways we can. And we feel um, where we fit in that specifically is helping within this area of higher education, bringing skills, knowledge, um, practical um, tools to the table, but also um, this contextualized discipleship framework as well to make it more holistic. And so um, we're, we're still learning how to do that. It's a process for us and have um, a lot of wonderful people who have come alongside. And I um, just want to extend an invitation to any of you if you are interested. We have two um, particular areas that we are um, looking for skilled volunteers in right now. One is with curriculum development. So um, especially in our areas of business or IT software development, um, if you have expertise in those areas or maybe know someone who does, um, I'd love for you to take one or a couple of these um, postcards that I have here. Um, our website has more information about um, specifically what we're looking for with volunteers. But that just means putting together lesson plans. So taking some of our online courses, as I described, but then building more of the Christian worldview questions, activities, maybe some additional articles or videos that they're reading, more of a Christian worldview. And then the second um, opportunity is if you're interested in mentoring um, a student or a small group of students. We have one guy um, here in Southern California, actually, who mentors. I think there's three IT students, and he's an IT professional. And he'll just meet on Skype, I think, with them maybe once a week. And um, it's been really, really powerful, um, just the relationship that, that he's building there. So I invite you if you're interested in that. Um, there's definitely opportunities. So. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. 
Learn more at viola.edu.